The game of Pokemon hides a dark secret. On the surface, it seems like a cute game about befriending magical creatures. But buried beneath those adorable critters, cheery music, and sometimes pretty visuals, is piles and piles of math. Behind every action, every attack, every step, there is an equation. But, if you can simply understand those equations, then you could be a true master of these games. Heck, with a few simple numbers, you could rebuild them from the ground up. So, that's exactly what I did. I've done a lot of videos in the past explaining all the math behind these games and using it to answer all sorts of absurd questions. So, to give myself some time to work on some other long-term projects that I've been wanting to do for a while, this week I thought I'd compile together three of my most math-intensive Pokemon videos to date for your binging pleasure. So stop worrying about whatever task you were procrastinating when you clicked on this video. Me personally, I've got an absolute mountain of dishes that I should be doing but instead of doing this. Because for the next hour and a half, we're gonna crack these games wide open to find the most optimal team type makeup for any region. Figure out how many encounters you'd probably need in order to complete the Pokedex and I figured we'd start off with a bang by completely rebuilding Pokemon Fire Red in a spreadsheet to find the luckiest run possible. Enjoy! Ah, Pokemon. Everyone's favorite game of pure skill. Sure, there is some RNG here and there, but by and large, anything bad that happens is the result of your own mist- Ah, crap. Okay, okay, so there might be some RNG here and there, but with the proper planning, you can be ready to adapt. Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? Are you- Okay, right, fine, that's fine. Sometimes you can just get dunked on and it's not your fault, but most of the time, son of a bitch. Luck. Love it or hate it, it's an undeniable part of Pokemon, of video games, and of life as a whole. It's the one unavoidable truth of our existence. Sometimes things go well, sometimes things go bad, and a lot of the time there's literally no rhyme or reason to it. We all know that you can get pretty unlucky in Pokemon, but have you ever wondered how lucky you could get? If your focus blast never missed, if your opponent never crit you to death, if you could walk through rock tunnel with nary a Zubat in sight. Is it even wise to start down this path? To learn of a treasure that we will never be able to possess? The answer is clear. No. That would be a very bad idea. So join me as I do an obscene amount of math, go insane counting tiles, and even simulate an entire game of Fire Red in a spreadsheet to be able to answer the question. What is the luckiest possible game of Pokemon? Richard, hit that intro. In order to find the single luckiest game of Pokemon possible, we first need to define what we mean by luck. Because technically speaking, there is no upper bound on how lucky you can get in a game like Pokemon. Sure, the game where you find 45 billion shiny Pokemon is pretty lucky. But what about the one where you find 45 billion and one? So for the sake of today's video, we'll be looking at luck as it pertains to a Pokemon Fire Red speedrun. And we'll define luck as anything that happens as a result of random chance that helps us beat the game faster than we otherwise would have. So, in order to find the luckiest possible speedrun of Pokemon Fire Red, 
All I need to do is go through every instance of RNG in the whole entire game and find the odds of something happening that will help you beat the game even a single frame faster. And I have very wisely given myself exactly one week to research, write, record, and edit this whole video. Seems totally doable to me. Stupid. Before we get too deep into the video, I want to take a second to shamelessly shill my Patreon. Real talk, these videos take a lot of time and effort to make. This one is spent, look at the time, look at the time of this one. That's too much. And they genuinely would not be possible without the support of viewers like you. So if you want to support the channel and help me make more videos like this in the future, and most importantly, if you can comfortably afford it, then there's a link in the top of the description that will take you to my Patreon page. There's a couple of tiers that get you access to all sorts of perks like early access, exclusive live streams, and getting to suggest and vote on future video topics for the channel. If you're not able to directly support the channel at this moment, absolutely no worries, I totally get it. Just subscribing and sharing the video with a friend helps out a ton too. All right, enough of that crap, let's get back to some math. So, here we go. We start the game and almost immediately come upon the first instance of RNG, your starter Pokemon. And already, there's a lot of random stuff that could go right or wrong. I'm sure the first thing that a lot of people think of when they hear the words luck and Pokemon is shinies. In generation three, any Pokemon has a one in 8,192 chance of being shiny, meaning that it has an alternate color palette and your starter is no exception. However, in the case of a speed run, Technically speaking, it's better to not get a shiny Pokemon because of the little sparkle animation that plays every time you send out- What? What? It's true- No, look, you send it out, it sparkles, it costs you a little bit of time every single day. Come on, look guys, the speedrunners are gonna eat me alive if I include that. You know what? Oh, fine, 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 you win. We'll make it shiny. Fine, fine, we'll do it both ways. I'll calculate the luckiest possible run with a shiny Pokemon and without a shiny Pokemon. Happy? <laughs> now, believe it or not, there's more to a starter Pokemon than its color palette. For anyone who's not intimately familiar with the Pokemon statistics generation formula, I'd like to apologize for the migraine in advance. Speedrunners have already determined that Squirtle is the most optimal starter choice for this game. But not all Squirtles are created equally. Speedrunners generally look for two things in a good starter Pokemon. Those being high IVs and a beneficial nature. IVs are a random number ranging from 0 to 31 for each of a Pokemon's six stats that influences how strong each of those stats will become. So, as an example, a Squirtle with zero IVs in HP is gonna have a lot less health than one with 31 IVs in HP, and the difference only becomes more pronounced as you level up. In the luckiest possible scenario, you'll get a Squirtle with 31 IVs in attack, special attack, and speed. The other three stats don't really matter as much because they all deal with health and defenses, and in this run, I don't plan on ever getting hit. Now, the more analytical among you may question this already, because yes, having a higher IV results in a higher base stat, but does that actually matter? Remember, we defined luck as anything that helps us beat the game faster, and realistically, having one less point in speed won't change anything for the long run. If we want to be truly accurate here, we should go through and calculate the lowest possible IVs that we can afford to get in each stat and still be able to beat the game as quickly as possible. And to that I say, I already did that. We'll get into all the math of the battles later, but it turns out that if you have even one IV less than perfect in 
any of these three stats, there is at least one instance where you won't be able to one-shot something that you could have with a crit otherwise, or one Pokemon that you can no longer outspeed and you have to watch their whole turn. If you want to beat this game as quickly as is theoretically possible, then you need to have perfect IVs in these three stats. But how rare is this? Well, IVs range from 0 to 31, so the odds of having a perfect IV in any given stat is 1 in 32, since 0 is also an option. To find the odds of getting perfect IVs in the three stats that we care about, we can multiply 1 in 32 by itself three times, or more simply, raise it to the third power. But we're not quite done yet. The other random factor that comes into play with your starter Pokemon is your nature. A Pokemon's nature provides a 1.1 times boost to one of its stats, excluding HP, and a 0.9 times nerf to another. Generally speaking, speedrunners prefer a nature that boosts special attack because you can more reliably KO a few Pokemon in the game. However, if you bank on always getting critical hits in these clutch moments, then technically speaking, a positive speed nature is more preferable as it will let you outspeed certain foes and take them out before they have a chance to go, since there's no critting on speed or anything. We don't want a nature that decreases either of our attacking stats, it will ruin the perfect IVs we work so hard for, but a drop in defense or special defense is totally fine. So that means that of the 25 possible natures, a hasty or naive Squirtle will be the best. That means that we need to multiply the 1 in 32 to the third from before by 2 in 25 to find the odds of randomly getting a perfect Squirtle. Doing all the math, we find that the odds of you randomly getting a perfect Squirtle for a speed run is 1 in 409,650 for a normal Squirtle, or 1 in 3 billion 355,443,200 for a shiny. And that is the very first thing you do in the game. Got a long way to go. After choosing your starter, you jump right into your first battle with your rival, but we're actually going to skip over that for now and talk about all the battles together later, because it gets really, really complicated. So instead, we'll do the easier thing and go touch grass. One of the hallmarks of this era of Pokemon is random encounters. Every time you enter a grass patch, cave tile, or water tile, you have a chance of encountering a wild Pokemon, which takes up some time. In a normal speedrun, they'll typically KO a few random Pokemon that they run into on Route 1 to get some early levels, then once they hit Pewter, they'll buy repels and never encounter a wild Pokemon again. But here's the thing, going to the Pokemart to buy repels takes time. Not a lot of time, and you will almost definitely save way more time in the long run, but the operative word there is almost. There is technically a non-zero chance that you could run through the entire game with no repels and still never run into a single Pokemon. But how do we find the odds of this happening? Well, it's quite simple actually. All I have to do is find the shortest possible path through the game and painstakingly count up every single grass cave and water tile that you have to walk through. Wait, what? Using the current world record speedrun as a guide, I was able to tally up every single tile that you walk through that has a chance to spawn a random encounter for each and every route and area in the game. Now, was this fun? No. That's it, that, that's the end of the sentence. But getting this list is only half the battle, because we still need to know the odds of encountering a Pokemon on each step. It turns out this can be easily determined by this formula. R is the base encounter rate for an area. 
This is 20 for all standard routes, 10 for caves and dungeons, 4 for water routes, and 25 for the safari zone. Plugging that into this formula, you will get the odds of encountering a Pokemon on any given step. So, to find the odds of not encountering a Pokemon, we can simply subtract that from 1. Then, we just need to raise that whole thing to the power of the number of tiles you have to walk through per route. If we do that for every single route and dungeon in the game, we'll have the odds of never getting an encounter without having to buy a single repel. Ha 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 if only it were that easy. Because it turns out, never getting a single encounter throughout the whole game would be really bad. This is generation three, which means that we're squarely in the age of HMs. There are four HMs that are required to complete this game, those being Cut, Fly, Surf, and Strength. Blastoise can learn the latter two, but for Cut and Fly, you have to catch someone else to help out. Typically, speedrunners will use a Pidgey for Fly and a Rattata for Cut. They are both super common on Route 1, you'll probably run into a few of them before you buy repels anyway. However, there is technically a better, but far less reliable option. Not for Fly, Pidgey is still the best for that. I mean, they're literally, you cannot escape. Oh my god, 20 Pidgeys! But the problem with Rattata as your cut Pokemon is that this is the only HM it can learn. This means that you'll have to end up teaching strength to your starter later in the game, which is fine, it's an okay move, but as you'll see much later, there are better options. Of the Pokemon available before Vermilion, which is when you need Cut By, Nidoran is the only one that can learn both Cut and Strength. If you manage to catch one of those, you'll be able to dump both cut and strength on there and save a slot for your starter later in the game. Now that sounds, well I'll be honest, that sounds pretty great. Why don't all speedrunners do this? Could it have something to do with the fact that there is a three tile window where you can encounter one of these without incurring some sort of time loss? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Oh, you can no, actually. It doesn't make sense. Hey everyone, Future Charlie here. I did such a terrible job explaining this next part that I literally couldn't salvage it without having an editor's note that looked like this. First of all, I said there were three required grass tiles on Route 3. That is not true. You can sail through this whole route without stepping on a single grass tile. In fact, you actually have to go slightly out of your way to hit one. The grass in this route is only required if you want a Nidoran, which we do. You can also technically get a Nidoran on Route 5 or a Sand Shrew on Route 4 if you're playing Leaf Green version, but they both require going even further out of your way than to get this Nidoran. I timed it out, this is your best possible option. When initially writing this video, I assumed that you would use a path like this, moving through three grass tiles, but that's actually pretty dumb. You could totally choose to walk through five grass patches, one grass patch, or anything in between without adding any extra steps. Running through a bunch of math that I'll get into later, it turns out that you have the best chance of getting a Pokemon that you need and not any other unnecessary encounters by walking through precisely two grass tiles, and the lowest chance if you walk through all five. Now, you could make the argument that if all routes are equal in terms of time, then the luckiest option would be if you took the worst path and still got the Nidoran and nothing else. But the general rule that I've been using is that you have to actively try to maximize your odds if you can, so long as it doesn't cost you extra time. 
If you're always going out of your way to make bad choices just to get more lucky, then you run into the same no upper bounds issue that I talked about in the beginning. So basically, I said you have to walk through three grass tiles on Route 3 to get a Nidoran. That's not true. You don't have to walk through any, but you should walk through exactly two. Alright, now back to the idiot. All that is to say, instead of finding the odds of never getting an encounter throughout the whole game, we need to find the odds of getting exactly two encounters, those encounters being a Pidgey and a Nidoran, and those encounters occurring before their associated HM gate. And that, well that's a little more complicated. To understand the sort of math required to figure this out, let's look at a far simpler example. Say you're rolling two dice, and you want to find the odds of getting exactly one six. Well, if we lay out all the possible combinations that you could roll, we see that of the 26 pairs, 10 of them have exactly one six. That means that you have a 10 in 36 chance of getting one six when you roll two dice. And when we look at the math, this makes sense. Instead of rolling the dice together, let's roll them one at a time. The first dice has a one in six chance of being a six. If it is, then the second die can be anything but a six, so a five in six chance. Or conversely, if the first die is not a six, again a five in six chance, then the second one has to be a six. Because we don't care which die is a six, either of these solutions will get us the outcome we're looking for, so we can simply add these odds together. However, you may notice that these two odds are actually the same odds, so we can simplify this to 1 sixth times 5 sixth times 2, the number of dice that we're rolling. And if you do the math, you'll see that this comes out to exactly 10 36 exactly what we expected. We can use this same logic for the Pokemon if we simply plug in the formulas from earlier for encountering and not encountering something on a given tile, and multiplying that by the number of tiles you walk through per route. The Nidoran can only be encountered on Route 3, so finding the odds are pretty easy. However, the Pidgey could show up in the grass on Route 1, Route 3, or Route 6, so it's easiest to calculate these three different scenarios independently than add the probabilities together in the end. If you find the Pidgey on Route 1, then you need to get exactly one encounter on Route 1 out of 52 possible encounter chances, and the other 51 we get no encounter. Since we don't care when that one encounter occurs in the route, we can use the same logic from the dice example to find the odds of that happening like this. Each encounter you get on Route 1 has a 50% chance of being a Pidgey, so we can multiply this whole thing by 0.5. And then, of course, you have to actually catch the thing. You have a 1 in 3 chance to capture a Pidgey in a Pokeball if it's at full health, which would be the fastest way to do it. Using the same formula, we can find the odds of getting exactly one Nidoran on Route 3 and catching it, and nothing on Route 6. And then we can use that same process for if we find nothing on Route 1 and a Pidgey on Route 6, or if we find both a Nidoran and a Pidgey or a Spiro on Route 3, and then, obviously, we want to repeat this process for if you want all your Pokemon to be shiny, or if you want to win. So, put simply, to find the odds of getting exactly one Nidoran and one Flyer before we need them, we can use this very basic equation. Just super, super basic. That accounts for all the routes before Vermilion, since there's no mandatory grass patches between here and Celadon where you can get fly. 
So for any route after that, we can use the first formula to find the odds of never getting encounters, and all that together is the odds of getting only two Pokemon that you need to fully traverse the game, and nothing else. And remember, we skipped over the battles in favor of doing this first, because this was easier. Battles are tricky because there's a lot of RNG at play, and there are a lot of battles. In a speedrun, there are 195 individual Pokemon that you have to battle, and for every single one, you have to find out which move has the best chance of killing, whether or not you need a crit, whether or not they'll outspeed you, whether or not their attack will miss, secondary effects, status conditions, all to find the fastest possible way to win each battle and the odds of that happening. So, you know, all pretty simple stuff. Obviously, this is a lot to keep track of, and if I did this all manually, then this video would literally never get done. But luckily, there is an easier way. All we need to do is completely simulate an entire game of Pokemon Fire Red within the confines of a spreadsheet. Any statistics and data analyst nerds out there, hold on to your pants. To start, speedrun.com has a pre-made spreadsheet with every single trainer in the game, their Pokemon, and those Pokemon's in-game stats. So I simply pulled out only the trainers that you have to fight as a part of this speed run and made that the basis for my new spreadsheet. I added in some more information like their types and EV yields, which will be important later. I call this section the baddies. If you look to your right, you'll see section number two of the spreadsheet entitled it's your boy Squirtle, here with all the information about my base stats that you could possibly hope for that seems a little too excessive, but is actually super important. A very aptly named section because it has all the information about your boy Squirtle that you could possibly hope for, which is all very critical to the workings of the rest of the sheet, and if I messed it up at all, it would literally ruin everything. Which I definitely did like four times. See, spreadsheets can do this cool thing where you can input specific formulas to have the spreadsheet do a bunch of math for you. So, as an example, this first column here will use this simple formula to keep track of the amount of experience you've accumulated by simply adding the XP gained from section 1 to the amount of XP that you just had. So, I can simply copy over all the XP yields for every Pokemon that you have to battle, and this column will automatically update. Then, the column next to it will use the total accumulated EXP to calculate what level your Squirtle will be at at any given time, using this equally simple formula. What the hell is that? Then we have our starter's base stats, making sure to increase them as our starter evolves at the appropriate levels, and after that, we have a section that will automatically keep track of all the EVs that our starter has accumulated throughout the game, because those are another thing that most Pokemon players outside of the competitive scene barely think about, but are super important to how your Pokemon grows as it levels. Did you know that your starter will gain 71 speed IVs across a whole speed run? Because I do now! And then lastly, we can plug all that information into the stat formula that Pokemon uses to calculate every single in-game stat for our starter Pokemon for every single battle in the game, making sure to only apply stat boost gained from EVs when you level up, not in between. And with that, we now know all the stats of our Pokemon and our opponent for every single battle in the game, and we have yet to simulate a single one of them. In order to simulate a Pokemon battle in a spreadsheet, we first need to check who goes first by comparing our starter speed stat to the speed stat of the Pokemon that it's facing. Then we need to calculate how much damage our Pokemon can do. The Pokemon damage formula for Generation 3 looks like this, but most of this stuff like weather and stockpile 
don't ever come into play, so we can simplify this equation down to this. This first section with all the parentheses is where we input all the stats information that we just calculated, along with the base power of the move in question. Any attack has a 1 in 16 chance of being a critical hit, which in Generation 3 deals 2 times as much damage. A move also deals 1.5 times more damage if its type matches the type of the Pokemon using it. We also need to account for the resistances and weaknesses of any given move by looking at the two types of the opponent we're attacking and applying the proper multiplier, and then lastly, accounting for the random roll that each move does when dealing damage. Whenever you attack, the game will generate a random number between 1 and 16 and convert that into a multiplier. So you have a 1 in 16 chance of getting a high roll and dealing full damage, but you also have a 1 in 16 chance of getting a low roll and dealing 0.85 times as much damage. Ooh. Now I could just assume that you're getting as lucky as possible and always getting a high roll and a critical hit. But remember, all the way back at the very start, we defined luck as anything that happens that helps you beat the game faster. Sure, getting a critical hit every single turn is unlikely, but if a Pokemon was very low on health anyway, then getting a critical hit doesn't actually help you. And in fact, you actually have to sit through an extra text box, which costs you just a tiny bit of time. So it's really better to only get a critical hit when you absolutely need it. Because of that, I can't just simply calculate one damage value for each attack. I needed to find four. One for a low roll, one for a high roll, one for a low roll crit, and one for a high roll crit. Then I subtracted that from the total HP that the defending Pokemon has, and if that value is less than or equal to zero, that means that you can KO that Pokemon in a single blow. If a regular attack is enough to KO a Pokemon without the need for a crit, then I didn't bother calculating the rest. That way, we know the most likely way that you can KO a Pokemon. Then, using the accuracy of each move and whether or not it needs to be a crit, I was able to calculate the odds of KOing a Pokemon with a single attack. In cases where it comes down to a random roll, instead of trying to program in some functionality where the spreadsheet will automatically calculate the roll required, that seemed like a lot of effort for a few edge cases. I just made it yell at me and go, Hey! Hey! Hey, idiot! Go check this one yourself, dummy! But I couldn't just do that for tackle. I had to do that for every single move that our starter can and will use throughout the game, making sure that they only come into play at the appropriate level. Then I could find which move has the best odds to one hit KO and automatically pull that value over to this final column. After that whole process is done, we find that the vast majority of battles can be won in a single hit if you're lucky. However, there are some edge cases that we need to look into. For starters, any time that we're not able to outspeed, our opponent gets an opportunity to attack. For these cases, I needed to look into the moveset of that Pokemon and consult a guide on how Trainer AI works to figure out which one of these moves they would use and then find the odds of that move missing or not getting a secondary effect. So that's all taken care of. But if we scroll down this final odds column, you'll notice some zeros sprinkled in here and there. That means that you have no move that can one-shot this Pokemon regardless of whether or not you crit. In these cases, I had to use Pokemon Showdown's damage calculator to simulate several turns of a battle, finding the most optimal way to KO that Pokemon with the help of crits and stuff when needed. I also had to keep track of certain secondary effects like moves that can flinch or apply status conditions because we can't have any of those, and then manually recorded those odds in one final column.
For the most part, the strategy for a run like this is pretty similar to a regular speedrun, with a few main differences. The first battle of the speedrun against your rival typically takes 4-5 to five hits, depending on how much he decides to growl. But if you get 2 crits and a halfway decent roll on one of them, then you can get it done in 2. As I mentioned before, a regular speedrun will generally KO a few wild Pokemon on Route 1 to get an extra level or two, which makes the battles in Viridian Forest more reliable. Unless, of course, you can score three crits on Bugcatcher Sammy's Weedle, in which case, you don't need it. From there, everything remains about the same, with the exception of catching the Nidoran that we talked about before, until you reach this kid, Youngster Josh. A speedrun will generally opt to fight this kid, even though you can technically skip him. The extra experience from this battle, combined with the rare candy that you can pick up, will get you to level 19 before you fight Misty, so that you can learn Bite, which can reliably two-shot her starving. However, they also make a quick pit stop to talk to this guy to learn Mega Kick, a very strong normal type move that only has 75% accuracy. The speedrun doesn't rely on it too much because they can easily miss, but if you're lucky, landing two crit mega kicks is enough to KO Starmie in the same amount of time, allowing you to completely skip the rare candy and Youngster Josh. Nerd! From here on out, you'll be a bit lower level than you would be in a typical speedrun, but if you're lucky enough to get crits whenever you need them, you can more than make up for the deficit. There is one last bit of RNG that we haven't talked about yet when you get to Vermilion, and that's Lieutenant Surge's Gym, aka the coolest, most fun, not infuriating, no skill puzzle in the whole game. In this gym, there are 15 trash cans. One random can will have a switch at the bottom of it, and then one of the cans next to it will have a second switch. The luckiest option would be for the first switch to spawn in the can right in front of you, which is a 1 in 15 chance. And then you have three more options for the second switch next to it, so you have a 1 in 3 chance of guessing right the first time. Multiply them together and you find that you have a 1 in 45 chance of solving the puzzle in one go. Wow, look at me having so much fun! There's nothing else super interesting for a long while. You completely steamroll the middle portion of the run, including clutching out a win against Giovanni in Celadon with an underleveled War Turtle. There is one complicating factor that we have to be aware of when battling trainers like gym leaders, and that's potions. If you're not able to KO a Pokemon in one shot and instead get them really, really low with the crit, then on their next turn, they'll just heal that Pokemon back up, putting you back to square one. In cases like this, it's better to get a regular hit on the first attack and then a crit on the second one to completely bypass their healing range. This doesn't really come into play until later battles in the Pokemon League, but it's important to note these cases where the order of operations is important. The real big change between this run and a speed run comes at the very end, against the final rival battle and the Elite Four. Normally, what you do is make a pit stop in the Celadon City department store and buy a bunch of X items. Then, at the start of each Elite Four battle, you take a few turns to juice up your Blastoise and then smash through their whole team. The problem is, Walking into the department store and buying all these items takes some time, nearly 50 seconds. And now, I'm not suggesting that you do this or saying that it's a good strategy, but technically speaking, if you get lucky enough, you don't need them. These X items make these difficult late game battles a lot more consistent and reliable but in Bizarro World, where you always crit when you need it, they don't actually save you any time. As an example, in the battle against Lorelei, you need to use two X specials to guarantee that you can win the battle in 11 turns. If you don't use these X specials and are relying on luck to get crits when you need them, then you can complete the battle in... 
11 turns. This same thing is true for every single battle in the league with two exceptions. Using X specials will save you one turn in the final rival battle before Victory Road and two turns against Agatha. Not using X speeds will also mean you can't outspeed eight Pokemon, meaning they'll get a free turn on you. Granted, if you're lucky, this free turn won't accomplish anything, but it's still time wasted. All told, this will add on an extra 17 seconds to your Elite Four run, but remember, we cut out 50 seconds from the trip to the mall, so all told, you can save a total of 33 seconds if you simply bank on having absolutely insane luck which honestly really doesn't sound that great when you spell it out. You still need some PP restoring items like ethers and elixirs for the Elite Four run that I made sure to factor in with the shortest routes through caves because there are a couple of cases where we'll be relying on Blizzard and Mega Kick, which we were able to hold on to because we had Nidoran for strength instead of having to put it on Blastoise. Both moves only have 5 PP, and Mega Kick specifically, we need to use 7 times. But, if everything goes exactly your way, if you never missed an attack, if you got every critical hit that mattered, if you dodged every attack that you possibly could, and only got the encounters that you absolutely needed, then congratulations! You've just beaten Pokemon Fire Red in what I can only imagine is record-breaking time. If not, I mean, that's on you at this point, man. There's only so much I can do. But after all of that, in what I can only imagine was a way too long video, we have come to the final solution. We have calculated the odds for every single instance of RNG in the whole game. Now, the final step is to find the odds of all of those things happening sequentially. To do that, we need to multiply each individual probability together. Everyone who clicked on the timestamp in the comments saying, answer is here, welcome back. Hey, it's me, Future Charlie again. Remember that one extra tile that I accidentally added in way back when? Yeah, that ever so slightly changed the final results, so now I gotta come back and redo this part too. <laughs> so, doing all the math, it turns out that the odds of getting perfect RNG in a Pokemon Fire Red speedrun assuming you don't get a shiny Pokemon, is 1 in 4.83 times 10 to the 202. An absolutely insane number that defies comparison, and yet, that's only scratching the surface. Because the odds of getting perfect RNG and getting a shiny Squirtle, Nidoran, and Pidgey or Spiro is a staggering 1 in 2.66 times 10 to the 214. That's 1 in 26.6 septuagintillion. Yep, that is a real number that I did not make up. Now, I'm gonna hazard a guess, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm guessing that most of you aren't regularly working with numbers in the Septuagintillions. So allow me to put that into perspective for you. There are an estimated 10 to the 82 atoms in the universe. The odds of getting this lucky in Pokemon Fire Red is the same as choosing one lucky atom out of two triquadratantillion universes. A unit that I'm sure we're all far more f Oh, oh no? You don't use triquadratantillions either? Hmm, okay, okay, how about this? How about this one? The smallest unit of time possible is the Planck time, 
which is equal to 10 to the negative 43 seconds. Try and divide time into smaller units than this, and you start violating the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And believe me, you don't want to do that. I have no idea what this is. So, say you have an incredibly fast quantum computer that can simulate an entire speedrun of Pokemon Fire Red every single Planck time. It would likely take this computer 84 traquinquagentillion years to get this perfect RNG run, which, as we all know, is approximately the time it would take for 7.3 untrigentillion black holes of one solar mass to fully decay due to Hawking radiation, or, of course, 8.4 novemtrigentillion times longer than it would take for every nucleon in the known universe to decay. So hopefully that clears some stuff up. Truthfully, the odds of getting a run this lucky are so infinitesimally small that we will, I'll say it, certainly never see it actually achieved. Unless, of course, you're a sick hacker, in which case, I mean, it'd probably be pretty easy. But if you do manage to beat these odds clean, these insanely small odds, then you, my friend, have made history. And you should probably make peace with the fact that nobody will ever believe you. Now, if you'll excuse me, this video took way longer to make than I thought, so I'm gonna go nap forever. Right, right, nap start. Ooh, well, that sure was a lot of numbers. But, now that we've all learned a lot, I think it's about time that I get back to those dishes, and you get back to whatever you've been putting off. But then again, while that last video was very informative, Unless you're great at picking random atoms, it might not be the most helpful. So, so, I'll tell you what, I'll give you something a bit more practical, and then do those dishes. Whenever I play through a Pokemon game, I like to plan out my team ahead of time. Scour the Pokedex to find the best type combination to tackle each of the game's challenges. But what if I told you that there was an easier way. A collection of types that, if represented on your team, could help you defeat any Pokemon game. Surely that can't be true. Can it? One of my favorite things about Pokemon is that there are a million different ways to build your team. There are the wingers who just play through the game and catch whatever looks cool to them, swapping out their team members all the time to suit their fancy. There are the completionists, who catch and use every single thing they find, be it a legendary beast or a ladybug that's just pretending to be a real Pokemon. There are the one-man teamers, who throw that tagline in the bin and only use one Pokemon the whole game. This category is exclusively made up of people doing challenge runs and dumb children. The Nuzlockers will use whatever scraps they can get their hands on because they killed all their good Pokemon already. And then there are the Planners, who meticulously go through the entire decks before they even tell the obligatory old man their name and know exactly who they're going to use from the moment they begin. If you couldn't tell, I'm usually that last one. Now, I don't always choose my teams based on pure strength, but what if I did? What if I compiled a list of the statistically strongest teams for every single region? That'd be, that'd be pretty crazy, wouldn't it? Richard, hit that intro. This video was suggested by Alakazam and voted on by my patrons. If you want to have a say in the videos that I make in the future, click the link below to visit my Patreon. So what constitutes a perfect team? It's a simple question that unfortunately has a not so simple answer, for it entirely depends on your definition of perfect. 
People have combed through every battle to find the best starter and built a team around them. People have found the highest possible base stat total across six Pokemon. Speedrunners found that you could stomp the whole game with a single Tentacruel in record time. So before we begin our search for the perfect team for any region, let alone every region, we first need to go through the rigorous scientific process of defining what a perfect team even is. According to Alakazam, who paid me $15 to suggest this video idea, a perfect team would be one that has no overall weaknesses, so at least one immunity or resistance to every type, and has some source of stab super effective damage against every major trainer in the game. So we're going with that. Even with that definition, building the strongest team for all nine regions in the game is gonna take a long time. But I am a man of the people, and if Alakazam decrees that I must, then it will be so. The strategy here is to go through each game, building the team as I go, making sure that it has at least one source of stab super effective damage for every gym before that gym, bearing in mind that the final team must have at least one resistance to every type in the game by the end. In any case where there are multiple valid options for team members to fulfill these two criteria, I will default to the one with the higher base stat total. By the end of this crazy logic puzzle process, we should have the strongest possible team for every single region. Also, while you're only allowed to have six Pokemon on your team at any given time, the game totally allows and sometimes even encourages you to swap Pokemon around as you go. So you could totally catch something to help you with an early gym that you will box in favor of something stronger later on. If you're a stone cold bastard, you think I'm the type of guy to kick my Mankey to the curb after using it to beat Brock, cast my brother-in-arms aside like a piece of garbage floating in the wind? No. Once a Pokemon joins my team, it's there for good. Unless it's only there for HMs, then by all means chuck it. But speaking of HMs, if we're doing this for every single game, then HMs are something that we're going to have to keep in mind. Most of these super special hidden moves are total trash and barely come up, even in the older games. So I can totally get you catching a Bidoof and loading it up with the stuff and then throwing it in the box, but there are two HMs that you generally want to have on you at all times because they're pretty essential for traversal and they're the only two that don't suck. Those being Surf and Fly. So for any of the earlier games where you need HMs, I'll make sure that you have a member on the team who can learn both of these. So to recap, a team needs to have something super effective against every major battle, the final team can't have any uncovered weaknesses, no substitutions, and the earlier games need to have access to fly and surf. Got all that? Great. Then it's time to begin with the Kanto region. Traditionally, Bulbasaur is considered the most optimal choice of starters for Kanto because it's the only one that's strong against both Brock and Misty, the first two gym leaders, and it resists Lieutenant Surge and Erica, so it can basically carry you single-handedly through the first half of the game, by which point you've probably caught some other Pokemon that can take you the rest of the way. However, when building a team with no weaknesses, I'll be honest, Grass sucks pretty bad, and it turns out that Squirtle is actually the better choice from a holistic team perspective. Squirtle can handle Brock for you, no problemo. For Misty, you can catch a Pikachu in Viridian Forest. For Lieutenant Surge, catch a Geodude in Mount Moon, and a Doduo on Route 17 for Erica, since Dodrio has the best stat spread for all the flying type Pokemon available at this point in the game considering Crobat isn't available until the post-game, if it even exists in that gen at all. For Koga, you need to catch a Poliwhirl by fishing with a good rod, 
basically anywhere, and trading it with this old dude in Cerulean City for a Jinx. And lastly, since Dark didn't exist in Gen 1, or really any of the Kanto remakes before post-game, if you want something super effective against Sabrina, then Ghastly is basically your only good option. That rounds out the 6th team member, so fully evolved, your team looks like this. Not too shabby. Blastoise can take out Blaine and Giovanni pretty easily, Raichu and Golem can handle Lorelei's water and ice types, Dodrio takes out Bruno's fighting types, Jinx mops the floor with Agatha's poison team, don't let her fool you, she only has three ghost types, and they're actually all the same ghost type. Jinx and Raichu can take down Lance, and you've got something super effective against all of your rival's team as the champion. And as promised, if we check the Team Builder tool from Maryland, we can see that it has at least one resistance to every single type in the game, with the exception of Dragon, which is only resisted by Steel, which doesn't exist in Gen 1. All in all, the only hole in this team, if you will, is that it doesn't have stab super effective damage against normal types. But let's be honest, Normal types are trash, and you've got a Gengar, so I don't know why you're worried. They literally can't even touch ya. If you really want that coverage, you could swap Blastoise for Polyrath, you know, if you don't mind staring your best friend in the world dead in the eyes and telling him that he'll never be good enough, and that you'd rather stuff him in the dark corner of a box for the rest of eternity than spend any more time with him, you know. It's entirely up to you. And there you have it. A perfect six-member team for the Kanto games. You've got an answer to every major trainer in the game. You resist everything that you can resist. You've got all your HMs covered. Overall, you can pretty much handle whatever the game throws at you. See? That wasn't too bad. Now we only have... Oh, eight, uh, eight more to go. All right, Johto time. For your starter, you're gonna want Feraligator. Honestly, none of the starters are that helpful offensively against any of the gyms, and water is the best of the three typings defensively. Catch a Geodude for Faulkner, a Zubat for Bugsy, Geodude slash Graveler can handle Whitney without super effective damage, no problem, and there's no fighting type that wouldn't totally screw up the team defensively later on. Get the Eevee from Bill and evolve it into an Umbreon for Morty, Crobat beats Chuck, Golem beats Jasmine, catch a Magnemite for Price, and a Mamoswine for Claire. This team of six, when fully evolved, has at least one resistance to every single type in the game, and it has a stab super effective option for every other major trainer because, well, it has perfect stab type coverage, except for Dark. You've got no stab, fighting, or bug moves, which means that the one dark type trainer in the game has exactly one pure dark type that you can't hit super effectively, but you can still resist it with Magnazone. And again, you have nothing super effective on normal, which again, is a trash type. Just throw Brick Break on someone and you'll be fine. I don't know why you keep bringing this up to me in this script here that I, that I wrote for you. Oh. All right, that's Johto done and dusted. Now we're cooking. Though, I do have to say, before moving on, is it just me, or are these two teams a little, a little similar to one another? I mean, they both have a water starter. They've got a lot of the same typings across them. Heck, they both have a golem. I guess in a way it makes sense. I mean, both teams needed to have a flying type for the HM, and since flying and fire have a lot of the same type coverage, then choosing a fire type starter would have been a little redundant. Water and grass also cover a lot of the same ground. Get it? Get it? Get it? And we needed a water type for surf, so there was really no need for any grass type. Electric was the better option for water coverage. Flying and water are both weak to electric, so a ground type was pretty necessary. Dragon is only weak to ice and itself in the early gen, so ice was pretty essential, as was a ghost or dark type for psychic trainers. Steel has so many resistances that it helped round out the Johto team, and had it been available in Gen 1, it would have accounted for that team's weaknesses as well. So having those seven types was sort of a given, I guess, and it just so happens that those by themselves themselves have nearly perfect stab coverage and cover each other's weaknesses perfectly. If there was room for a fighting type for that normal and dark coverage, you'd be good to go, huh? Well, it's almost, it's almost like if you just built a team where all of these types were represented and you just 
made sure that you got them before you needed them for a gym or something, then you could have a perfect team for any region. But, 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 no, 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 I'm getting ahead of myself. I mean, it's only happened two consecutive generations, both of which featured Kanto. It's hardly enough to suggest some sort of master pattern. I mean, I mean, it's not like the perfect team for Hoenn would have been Swampert, Swellow, Shiftry, Medicham, Magnezone, and Glalie. <gasps> <laughs> it would seem that I owe you an apology, Alakazam, my friend. For you see, I have not accomplished the goal that you set out for me. I have not found the best team for every region. I found the best team for any region. Just make sure you have a water, flying, ground, ghost or dark, ice, electric, steel, and fighting if you can manage it, though it's not needed, all represented somehow. Make sure that you get them early enough to help you with each gym, and you win. Simple as that. Don't believe me? Watch. Diamond and Pearl, you've got Empoleon, Staraptor, Luxray, Gengar, Garchomp, Abomasna. Black and White, Samurott, Unpheasant, Excadrill, Vanillix, Galvantula, Chandelor. Black and White 2, easy. Samurott, Lucario, Crobat, Crocodile, Vanillix, Galvantula. <laughs> yes, yes, I've cracked the code. I can see everything so clearly now. It all makes sense. Do you still doubt me? Do you still doubt my power? Kalos, Greninja, Talonflame, Aurorus, Lucario, Jolteon, Golem. Alola, you don't even need HMs anymore, so you could ditch the water and flying types, but the formula is so perfect, why on God's green earth would you do that when you could have Primarina, Crabominable, Braviary, Magnezone, Alolan, Marowak, and Garchomp? <laughs> You think Pokemon is all a game? You think Pokemon is about making choices? In science, there are only two choices. The right one and the wrong one. Galar, Inteleon, Corviknight, Galvantula, Mamoswine, Beware, Cursula, Paldea, Quaxley, Kilowattrell, Goldingo, Grimmsnarl, Garchomp, and Baxcalibur. Alakazam, you ask for the strongest team for every region? Well, I have delivered to you the strongest team for every region. And the strongest team for every region that will ever and can ever be made. Ironically, none of which contain Alakazam. I have derived a formula that will bring you success in every single endeavor. Let Thanos search for his Infinity Stone, let Voldemort guard his Horcruxes, and Sauron forge his ring, for I have no need of any of them. With these seven types, maybe eight if you can swing it, I can build the perfect team. With these seven, again, maybe eight pieces, I can rule the world. <laughs> Again, I want to stress, fighting isn't necessary. I mean, it might be helpful, but normal types are trash, so I don't really think you have to worry. Wow, wasn't that neat. But enough is enough. The pile of dishes has grown to truly a disturbing level. I'm pretty sure they're congealing to a single sentient entity threatening to swallow my whole kitchen, so I really must deal with that. There's time to catch the perfect team later. But speaking of catching the perfect team, the true goal of every Pokemon game is, and always has been, to complete the Pokedex. To catch them all, as it were. But have you ever wondered exactly how big of a task that is? If you go around randomly encountering Pokemon, about how many encounters should you expect to have before catching every single one? Well. With just a few more equations and another unreasonably large spreadsheet, we can find just that. For just the Kanto region, if I did this for all nine generations, this video would be six more hours, and I cannot stress this enough, the dishes cannot wait that long. Oh, in fact, in fact, I think I hear, I gotta go, I, oh, oh, gotta catch them all.
It's been the slogan of the Pokemon games since the very beginning. It's the ultimate goal for every Pokemon trainer. It's the mark of a true Pokemon master. But how hard is it to actually do? If you really wanted to catch every Pokemon, how long would it take? This seemingly simple question has led me down perhaps the deepest rabbit hole on the channel yet, forcing me to learn about everything from advanced probability and statistics to geometric distributions to alternate realities layered within alternate realities. And today, I'm going to take you on that journey with me. This is the average number of encounters required to complete the red and blue Pokedex. Richard, hit that intro. A huge thanks to Aspa102 and FS for suggesting this video topic on my Patreon-exclusive Discord server. More information on that in the description down below. This topic was inspired by a video by Numberphile, where they use geometric distributions to estimate that you'd need an average of 751 encounters to find every Pokémon in the Kanto Pokédex. It's a great video. But they did make a couple of pretty big assumptions and simplifications that make their answer not quite as accurate as it could be. Now, to be clear, I don't have any problems with these assumptions. The real goal of that video was to teach you about geometric distributions. If they need to sacrifice a little bit of accuracy to do so, I totally get it. But. Whenever I make assumptions in a math-heavy video, there's always a couple of people that aren't too pleased with me, to say the least. People who'd rather I increase the complexity of every problem tenfold in order to account for every tiny little detail to get the most accurate answer possible. So today, we're gonna do exactly that. We are going to find the true average number of encounters you would need in order to obtain all 150 Pokemon in the red and blue Pokedex. No assumptions, no shortcuts, just pure accuracy. How hard could it be? To start, our job here might be a bit easier than originally thought because you don't actually need to encounter all 150 Pokemon to complete the Pokedex. Take starters, for example. You get one free starter for every save file. Just get a couple of friends to trade you their starters, and you can have all three of these Pokemon, no encounters necessary. I definitely used real friends to get mine, and didn't just shell out money to get an extra Game Boy and another copy of the game to trade them to myself. Nope. Real friends. All told, there are 10 gift Pokemon in the game that you don't need to encounter, which brings the real total required encounters to 140. There's another five that you can get from in-game trades using Pokemon you've already caught, and there's also static Pokemon in the game that you can battle simply by talking to them in the overworld, rather than a random encounter. You still need to battle and catch them, of course, but there's no chance involved in finding them, so it didn't feel right to include them in a list like this. And then, of course, there's evolutions. If you catch a Rattata, you don't actually need to find Eradicate. You can simply get your Rattata up to level 20 and it will evolve into Eradicate and get registered in your Pokedex that way. True, in some instances it might be easier to catch the evolved form of a Pokemon rather than battling the Elite Four a million times to evolve all your garbage bugs and rodents, but you don't technically have to encounter any of them. 
So, throwing out all the Gift, Trade, Static, and Evolution Pokémon, out of the total 150, you only have to actually encounter and catch 53 of them, including two Spearows, one of them to trade and one to evolve into a Fero. Considering that, it seems like catching them all might be a bit easier than we thought. The other big assumption that Numberphile made is that every Pokémon is equally rare and all appear in one single area. So, on any given encounter, you're equally likely to encounter a Zubat, or a Charizard, or a Mewtwo. As I'm sure you all know, though, that's not how the game works. Depending on the route you're on, certain Pokémon will be insanely common, others will be incredibly rare, and most are straight up unattainable. They chose not to account for this because, in their words, But we're not gonna model that, it's too hard. But I think that we can do a little better than that. I mean, how hard could it be? There is one final assumption that I am going to keep though, and that's assuming that you catch every Pokémon on your first attempt. If you're trying to complete the Pokédex, odds are you've got a huge stock of Ultra Balls and a Pokémon with a good status condition to make catching them easier. If you're failing encounters at that point, I'm gonna chalk that up to a skill issue. With one notable exception that I'll talk about later. So, with all that in mind, how do we go about finding something like this? Well, the best place to start is with a plan. I pulled together a list of every Pokémon you need to encounter to complete Red and Blue's Pokédex, and found the most common area where each of those Pokémon is available. As an example, Pidgey can be found on just about every route in the game, but it's most common on Route 1 so you're best off searching for one there. So, what we're left with is a list of routes and all the Pokémon you should be searching for when you're on those routes. If we simply visit these areas one by one and don't leave until we have everything we want, then before you know it, you'll have a full Dex. Now, all we have to do is find the average number of encounters you'll need on each individual route before you find all the Pokémon you're looking for and add them all together. That doesn't sound too bad. In the number file video, we learned that the average number of encounters required to find any one Pokémon is one over the probability of encountering it. I won't go into the full proof here, you can check out their video if you want to learn more, but intuitively this makes sense. If a Rattata has a 50% spawn rate on Route 1, then you can expect to find one in two encounters. It gets a bit more complicated when you throw in multiple Pokémon and different spawn rates, but in essence, we can use this one simple equation for every single route in the game. For this video, we'll be searching for Pokémon from most common to least common, because it makes it easier to explain, and it increases the chance that you'll happen upon a rarer Pokémon while searching for the more common ones, as opposed to finding 2 billion Pikachus while searching for that rare Electabuzz. With that in mind, we begin with Tentacool, which has a 100% spawn rate while surfing on Route 19, or really, most water routes in the game. That means that it will take one encounter to find a Tentacool. Huh. Well, that was pretty easy. Oh. The next area we set our sights on is Diglett's Cave. Here, you have a 95% chance of encountering a Diglett, and a 5% chance of encountering a Dugtrio. Now, in most games, it wouldn't actually matter which of these Pokémon you encountered. If you find a Diglett, then you can just evolve it into a Dugtrio, or if you find a Dugtrio, then you can just throw it in the daycare and hatch yourself a Diglett. Either way, you wind up with both Pokémon in your decks. But remember, we're looking at the Pokédex for Red and Blue specifically, and in those games, there is no daycare, meaning that you have no way of creating that Diglett egg. 
This means that in order to complete the Pokedex, we absolutely must encounter a Diglett here. So using the same equation, we can divide one by Diglett's spawn chance, which we'll call PD, and find that we can expect to find a Diglett in 1.05 encounters. We can use this same very simple process for any route in the game where we're only looking for one Pokemon. Unfortunately, things get a little more complicated when you start throwing in multiple required Pokemon. Take Route 6 as an example. If you fish with the good rod, you have a 50% chance of finding either a Goldeen or a Poliwag. And in this case, we actually want both of these Pokemon. For that reason, we need to modify our equation a tiny bit. Instead of using the spawn probability for one specific Pokemon, we want to use the probability of finding something that we don't already have. So on our first encounter, we want either a Goldeen or a Poliwag, it doesn't matter which. So we can do one over the probability of finding a Poliwag plus the probability of finding a Goldeen. Since they're the only two Pokemon on this route, the odds of finding one or the other is simply 100%. So on the first encounter, we are guaranteed to find something we don't already have. We'll call this first encounter T1. So say on the first encounter you find a Poliwag and catch it. Well, now for your second encounter, T2, you have a 50% chance of encountering a Goldeen and then you're done. But you also have a 50% chance of encountering another Poliwag, which you don't need anymore. Or if you caught Goldeen first, then it's the other way around. Either way, you now only have a 50% chance of finding a new Pokemon, meaning that it will take you an average of another two encounters to find the second Pokemon, T2. Add that to the one encounter from T1, and we find that it will take you an average of three encounters to find both Poliwag and Goldeen. Okay, so adding in a second Pokemon makes it a little more complicated, but still, not that bad, especially when both Pokemon are equally rare. And for the first couple of rounds we explore, this will be enough. But as you go further into the game, a few more complicating factors arise that we need to account for. Take Route 11, for example. If you're playing Pokemon Red, then you can find Spiro, Ekans, and Drowsy on this route. While you do need Spiro for your decks, it's far more common elsewhere, so you don't need to catch one here specifically. The only Pokemon we actually need here are Ekans and Drowsy. Effectively, we have the same two Pokemon setup that we did with the Poliwag and Goldeen on Route 6, only with one major difference. Ekans and Drowsy have different spawn chances. For the first encounter, this doesn't matter much, we simply add their two probabilities together, and finally you have a 65% chance of finding either an Ekans or a Drowsy. Plug that into our equation, and we find that you can expect to find one of these two Pokemon in about 1.5 encounters. But now, we run into some trouble. Say you found the Ekans first. Well. Now you have a 25% chance to find a Drowsy, meaning it will take you an average of four more encounters. Add them together, and it should take you 5.5 encounters to get both. But it's also possible that you found the Drowsy first, in which case you now have a 40% chance to find the Ekans, which will only take you an average of 2.5 encounters, or four encounters for the whole route. So we have two different scenarios with different likelihoods of occurring. To reconcile these two and find the average number of encounters for the whole route in any scenario, we need to take the weighted average, meaning we need to multiply each expected encounter total for the second Pokemon by its likelihood of occurring and then add them together. So, what's the likelihood that we found an Ekans on the first encounter? Well, you might think that it's simply 40%, its spawn rate for the route. But remember, 
If we made it to T2, it means that we had to have encountered either an Ekans or a Drowsy on T1. If we encountered a Spiro, then we'd still be on T1. So what we need to do is divide the probability of finding an Ekans by the probability of finding either an Ekans or a Drowsy, which are the only two possible encounters that would have allowed us to make it to T2. This gets us the adjusted probability. We'll call this PE prime. E for Ekans and prime for it's different. We then multiply that by the expected number of encounters for a drowsy, and then repeat that process for PD prime. If we simply add these two together, then we'll find that it will take you an average of 3.4 encounters to find the second Pokemon, whichever it may be. Add that to the 1.5 from before, and we find that it will take you an average of 4.9 encounters to find both a drowsy and it Ekans on Route 11. And thankfully, that's all the math that we need to do for this route. There is nothing else that will make this even more complicated than it already was. Uh, we're done, we can just move on. Ah, hello, it's me, Charlie from another dimension. It's about to get more complicated. Because while the easiest place to find an Ekans is on Route 11, you also have a 25% chance of finding it on Route 10, which by this point, you'll have already visited. Since it wasn't very common on Route 10, it was more efficient to wait to search for it here, but there is a chance that you already found one while searching for the Voltorb that you actually wanted there. And if that's the case, then you don't actually need to search for the Ekans here at all. You can just catch a Drowsy and then move on. So, not only are there two alternate universes where you found either a Drowsy or an Ekans first, but there's also a third alternate universe where you already had an Ekans coming into this route. That means that we need to take another weighted average for the expected encounters for both an Ekans and a Drowsy, which we just did, and the expected encounters for just a Drowsy. The odds that you never found an Ekans on Route 10, and therefore still need to catch one on Route 11, is 1 minus its spawn rate on Route 10, which is 25%, raised to the number of encounters you had on that route. In other words, it's the probability that any one encounter is not an Ekans raised to the number of chances you had to find an Ekans. We can expect to have an average of 2.22 encounters on Route 10 to find the Voltorb. But remember, in order to have made it to Route 11, one of those encounters had to have been a Voltorb, meaning that you'll have an average of 1.22 chances to find an Ekans. So plugging that into the formula, we find that you have a 70.3% chance of not finding any Ekans on Route 10, meaning you still need to catch one on Route 11. The odds of finding at least one Ekans on Route 10 is simply one minus the probability of never finding any, since you either found an Ekans or you didn't. Then we just need to multiply the odds of finding no Ekans on Route 10 by the expected encounters to find both an Ekans and a Drowsy on Route 11, and then multiply the odds of finding at least one Ekans on Route 10 by the expected encounters to find just a Drowsy on Route 11, and add them together to find that you can expect to have an average of 4.6 eight encounters on Route 11 before you have everything you need. And then, of course, you have to boot up Pokemon Blue version and go back to Route 11 to do the whole thing over again to find a Sandshrew, since Ekans and Sandshrew are version exclusive Pokemon that need to be traded from other games. Ah, <sighs> thankfully though, this is as complicated as it gets. I mean, it's not like there's any areas where you need to catch multiple of the same Pokemon for in-game trades, and also that Pokemon may or may not have been found on multiple other routes, or areas where you need to catch 
three different Pokemon, all with different spawn rates, meaning I needed to account for multiple layers of alternate realities stacked on top of one another with different P's, P primes, and P double primes. And oh yeah, there's also a chance that you already found a Pikachu earlier in the game, which means that half of these alternate realities may or may not actually exist. I mean, thank God I don't have to deal with any of that, right? <laughs> All right, look, maybe this whole process was a little more difficult than I thought, and maybe I should have trusted the guy with a PhD who works for Oxford who said that this was too hard. But after painstakingly going through every area in the game and accounting for every minute detail and possibility, I now have the expected number of encounters to find all 53 Pokemon required to complete the Kanto Pokedex. All but four of them. Remember earlier when I said we were assuming that you'd catch every single Pokemon on your first encounter with one exception? Well, it's time for that exception. As it turns out, there are four Pokemon in the game that can only be found in the Safari Zone. For those who don't know, Battles in the Safari Zone work a little differently than regular battles. Instead of lowering a Pokemon's HP to make them easier to catch, you have to throw mud and bait at them to lower their catch rate or make them less likely to flee, something that normal wild Pokemon can't do. In effect, there's a lot more RNG involved in Safari Zone battles than usual, and you are far from guaranteed to capture something on your first attempt. In game design terms, we would refer to something like this as... Not very good. Because there's so much luck and very little strategy involved here, I can't in good conscience assume that you'll catch everything in one go, which means that not only do we need to find how many encounters you'd need to find one of these Pokemon, we also need to find the average number of tries it would take to actually catch one. Now, I'll admit, the mechanics behind the Gen 1 Safari Zone are very complicated, so I thought I'd just read a little excerpt from the Bulbapedia article on it to give you a sense of what we're dealing with here. At the start of an encounter, two counters, an angry counter and an eating counter, the end of each turn, are set if to zero. Angry, a random value encounter is zero on zero. zero. The opposite the angry is is the of the is zero. The opposite of the angry is zero. As you can see, Finding the expected number of tries to catch a Safari Zone Pokemon is a pretty hard question to answer, especially for a video that's already on page 6 of the script. So I'm going to take a slightly simpler approach and just not do any of that. Instead, I just calculated the number of encounters to find each Safari Zone Pokemon and multiplied it by 1.5, assuming it'll take you one to two tries per Pokemon. Is this a bit of a cop-out? Maybe. But after everything I've done, I'm not dealing with degrading counters and Gen 1's stupid catching system, all right? I won't do it. You can't make me. Unless you subscribe to my Patreon, where you can suggest and vote on future video topics, in which case I would literally be contractually obligated to make a whole video on it. Link in the description down below. But I know you won't do that, you cowards. But finally, after all of that, we can simply add together the expected number of encounters for each route in the game to get our answer. The total number of encounters you will probably need to complete the Kanto Pokedex. For reference, number file's estimate was 751.59 encounters using their geometric distribution method. Adjusting for the fact that you only need to catch 53 Pokemon as opposed to 150, their method would have predicted 210.42. Were they close? Well, accounting for everything, from spawn rates to 
every different permutation and combination of varying rarities, the true expected number of encounters required to catch them all and get Professor Oak's seal of approval is a 254.46, meaning that number files crude, oversimplified estimation missed out on a whole 44 encounters. You made me do this for 44 encounters. Sure, in the end, it looks like number file got pretty darn close to the real answer using their far easier method. But I think there's still a valuable lesson to be learned here. If you put in the work, if you don't take shortcuts, you can find the perfect solution to any problem. But you probably should just take the shortcuts because you can get pretty damn close and save yourself a ton of time. I Take the path of least resistance, y'all. Don't be a dummy. Everyone who's always roasting me in the comments whenever I take the slightest shortcut or omit some tiny detail, it doesn't actually matter that much. Not for a damn YouTube video. We're not solving. Scary dish monster. Oh, I'm gonna get you. You better watch out. Oh, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm gonna get you with this fork. I'm gonna scare you with a fork. And a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alakazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the Win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, Starjoy, The Boss Killer 94, and Captain Kirby.